The Focus of Freedom, from the Freedom Tabernacle Baptist Church and Freedom Tabernacle Ministries in Atkins, Virginia. Home of Camp Freedom, a regional outreach to our youth. Freedom House, offering counseling, intervention, emergency shelter, and food distribution. And with our many missionary partners, reaching out around the world with the light and love of the gospel of Christ. And now, the focus of freedom. So upon the infallible, eternal, undeniable word of God I stand. Thank you, Sam, as always. And thank you for being there in the viewing audience. We appreciate it. We really, truly do. I mean, from our heart, we sincerely realize that wouldn't be a bit of use in me being here if you weren't there. So putting it simple, thanks for watching. Now, we got a couple of announcements for you to begin with. If you live in and around the Galax, Virginia area, we'll be there again, our Mother's Day, annual Mother's Day revival, uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday uh, this week. Camp Zion Church, just go right out route, uh, right down there south of uh, Galax on Route 89 and look up on top of the hill. Everybody knows where Camp Zion Church is. Brother Rodney Greeson, the fine young pastor, been there for several years now uh, since Brother Bill Davis has had his physical infirmities. And we appreciate Rodney, appreciate all the folks. And so if you're watching on YouTube or here on Living Faith Television, uh, please pray for this meeting. Camp Zion Church, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday this week. Keep us in prayer and we would appreciate it. Then, of course, remember now, through Memorial Day, on Memorial Day a night, through that Wednesday night every year out on the Volunteer Parkway, Dr. Gary Montgomery and all the folks at Parkway Baptist Church certainly invite you to remember uh, this year's Jubilee there at Parkway. Now, as far as here as Freedom, we've got a special announcement for all of our families there in and around the Marion area, all Smith County actually. E-Camp returns to Camp Freedom this summer from June the 12th until July the 21st. Early in the morning till up in the afternoon, you know the routine from last year. The children will have a good nutritious breakfast. You get them out there then, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock like you did last year. Some of you made arrangements even earlier. But they'll have breakfast and then a full day of activity with a hot nutritious lunch served as well. And they'll be having their drama theater, their Bible history class, their recreation, uh, uh, some uh, ethics, I think, and some ethics etiquette and just all kinds of well-rounded behavioral classes, Bible classes, Bible history classes, just a full wonderful day uh, for the children. Now those applications will be in some of the uh, elementary schools there, Marion and Atkins, I think for sure Atkins, and last year I think Marion also uh, available at the Bradley's Funeral Home on Main Street there in Mar Marion. On the hill just beside of Food City, you can go by there and pick up an application, or especially you parents with the children there at the elementary schools in Smith County, or just click on ftministries.org and the applications are online, and so you can find out all about that. Now, you do need to get your child registered. There is a registration form, absolutely no cost as always. This is a home mission outreach, so no charge to your children or to you as a family. It's all free, but please remember, just because it's free does not mean it's cheap. It is a wonderful program for your children, and it'll be our honor and our blessing to have your children with us at this summer's e-camp at Camp Freedom. Camp Freedom, bringing children to Christ since 1975. So pray for us. Now, one quick update about the building here. We've got to get the sound completely installed as we're just, you know, going a little bit at a time, paying for this, paying for that. And so just keep standing with us here as we finish everything up, and we appreciate that from the very bottom of our heart. Now, the most important reason why we're on the air is to be a blessing to you, our viewer. We want to try to be an encouragement to you if you've run into some discouraging situations. If you're not a Christian man, uh, we want to tell you about the gospel of the Son of God. He loved you so much he took your place on an old rugged cross, died so you could live. 
He really loves you. He absolutely does. Man, that's the good news. And he'll make your heart his home. And he'll be with you from now on. You can't beat a deal like that. He'll help you every day. He'll be your partner in power. Everything you need, he'll supply. So if you're not a Christian, please open your mind to the gospel and then receive Christ into your heart. So glad to have you with us tonight, no matter who you are, where you're watching from. And if you are one of those who are struggling, perhaps one of your children has gotten into this drug stuff and some bad things going on in your family. Listen, you're not forgotten by God. Just because your heart is hurting doesn't mean that the Lord's done run off somewhere and forgotten about you. He's right there where you are. And the message tonight from the Word of the Lord from the book of Genesis, we're going to be talking about old Abraham. Everywhere he was, he built him an altar, he dug him a well, and he had him a lamb. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you've got you a good strong altar and you've got you a good deep fresh well and you've got the Lamb of God in your life, <laughs> we're going to make it. I promise you, you are. The Lord is your shepherd, so you won't have any, any lacking whatsoever. He'll provide your every need. Good to have you with us tonight, truly is. So that takes care of the announcements and a little bitty update and a welcome. So now, what are we waiting on? Let's just go to church together via television, and we hope and pray that God will richly bless to your heart and to your life and to your mind this week's edition of The Focus of Free. Genesis chapter number 21 and verse 30. Genesis 21, 30. And he said, For these seven new lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me that I have digged this well. The just shall live by faith. That's in your Bibles and basically Habakkuk 2, 4. Very favorite Old Testament prophecy of mine is the book of Habakkuk. He asks all the hard questions. Why did the righteous suffer? Why did little children get sick? All, all of these unjust, unfair things that we see all around us. And the summation that he makes in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is very simple, concise, and yet amazingly perplexing to the natural mind of the human being and yet extremely comforting to the spiritual mind of those who have been saved. Simply, the just shall live by faith. The Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit moving his pen, repeated that in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 3.8, and at least those three places where the apostle repeated that those who are saved, those that have been justified by the blood of the lamb will live their earthly life by faith. So therefore, brothers and sisters, let me say this. By our faith in God, we can live this life. Jesus said, Mark eleven twenty two, 22, simply this, have faith in God. How many times have I told you all not to have faith in me? And I've learned a long time ago that I can't put my faith in human beings because human beings will inevitably, absolutely, they will let you down. I'll let you down, you'll let me down, but Jesus said, have faith in God because God will never let any of us down. When Jesus walked this earth, he was a praying person. And according to Paul to Timothy, he put faith in his own self, in his own grace, in his own mercy, in his own love, and in his own power. Jesus is the king of the kingdom. He did not put his faith in his disciples. He taught his disciples to have faith in him. And Jesus put his faith in himself alone. So by our faith in God, we live this life. By our following of God. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 8, 22, follow me. And he said that over and over and over again. Not to follow religion, but to follow him. Not to follow philosophy, but to follow him. So by our faith in God, by our following of God, then we're gonna be able to live not just meagerly or survive, but Jesus said in John 10, 10, I'm come, I want you to have life abundantly on that earth. Not just eternal life in heaven, but abundant life on earth. Now listen to me this morning. You can listen to a lot of preachers. You can read a lot of Christian books. You can listen to Christian psychiatrists, psychologists, all these different deals. But until you get it down in your mind 
That's surrendering the sum total of who you are and committing the sum total of who you are to the sum total of who he is and knowing that we are one together with him now and being led by his spirit shows forth to us and others that we are the children of God, Romans chapter eight. And he said, let the dead bury their dead. Now, was that uh, mean spirited of Jesus to tell people in their moments of sorrow Let their dead bury the dead, you follow me. In other words, we're always gonna have burdens and troubles and battles. None of us know what this week holds for us. None of us know what this afternoon holds for us. I'm standing in this pulpit before you right now, but before the sun goes to sleep over the western horizon, you could hear of my physical demise. Proverbs 27, one, how many times have we quoted it? Boast not yourself of tomorrow. It doth not yet appear what you shall be or what's going to be on tomorrow. We can't boast ourselves of tomorrow because we have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. But we certainly are assured of who's going to be right here with us tomorrow. He's yesterday, he's today, he's forever. So again, our faith has got to be in him. And then because of that, our following must be of him. And we got to understand that we may be burying our dead tomorrow. We may be in the hospital tomorrow. But let's all hope real honestly and candidly this morning that we're all grinning like mules eating briars and we're happy as we could be tomorrow. We all want to wish the best for everybody. But whether it's good or whether it's bad circumstantially, he's still going to be right here with us. And we've got to be obeying him and trusting him. So by our faith in God, by our following of God, and then listen to this by our force from God. Interesting, Matthew eleven twelve, 12, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Now this is, a, this is a word from Jesus that you've got to step back just a little bit and think about, as really they all are, but some of the words of our Lord, as far as I'm concerned, are very clear, concise, easy to understand. Others of them, he intentionally means for me to pray over them a little bit and think about it a little bit and trust the Holy Spirit to give me the proper interpretation of what it is he's saying. He said, always the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence. Now, I think what he means by that, there's always going to be opposition to God. The devil's going to see to that. Uh, I read a little piece where the atheist associations or whoever they are has got this little prayer bench in Philadelphia somewhere, I think, removed from a veterans memorial park. Well, I got news for them one thing. They'll try to remove the crosses from veterans cemeteries, but that's going to be awful tough, ain't it? Because there are hundreds of thousands of them across this land. But what should be our attitude as the people of God? Should we want to ball up our fist and bust them in the nose? Should we want to take ball bats or clubs or something and try to physically harm somebody? Now, being honest with you, sometimes our fleshly nature feels like that. But 2 Corinthians 10, 4, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is always going to suffer violence. And then he said, and the violent take it by force. That word violent in that old English language is not necessarily what we think it to be that we would cause harm like some of these wackos marching in the streets now, busting out windows and stealing stuff and burning stuff and showing forth the true contents of their heart that just evil and dark and unacceptable for a fluid and a society that would love one another. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about we're gonna understand our opposition. And our opposition is not flesh and blood from Ephesians 6. Listen, ladies and gentlemen and brothers and sisters, the devil's real. Evil exists in this world. Our little region is trying to fight back about the, uh, uh, toward this drug scourge, but you're, you're not going to be successful as the Lord's church until we repent that we've got a, 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 a fault in this thing, that we've got some accountability in this thing. How in the world can the devil be so successful in devastating so many lives if the Lord's church had not been derelict of duty and divided so extensively to where we do our own thing so intentionally 
and unintentionally though, we elbow Christ out of the kingdom. And if the king is not in the kingdom, you don't have a kingdom of God. You have a kingdom of this world. And Jesus plainly said through the pen of Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 that the devil is the God of this world. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you'll do the will of your father, the devil, because you are the children of the devil. So how horrible it is that not only does the devil have his way in those that are out here in the world professing to be lost, claiming not to know God, but the problem is how great is that darkness if the light in you is dark. And so we've got an overabundance of religious people. And religious people, just like the Pharisees of old, sadly and tragically, are not pro-Christ. Many times, they're anti-Christ. John dealt with them in 1 John. The spirit of Antichrist is in the world. And if we deny his lordship, and we allow our human spirit to be the dictator of our being as a child of God, then at best we are carnal and we are far from being spiritual. And therefore, when the church gets in such a state, there is existing no other deterrent to the devil and no other defense against the devil. So the next time you think, oh, our nation is so sinful and we've got so many problems, then where is the salt? Where is the light? Ask yourself that question and stop doing what we've been doing, manifesting pride, throwing back our shoulders, stretching out our chest and saying, well, we will solve this problem. You're not gonna solve anything. It's gonna take God. We're not gonna be able to go out here and and ramrod and control the forces of the devil apart from the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God. And God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So the violent, those that recognize our opposition, take it by force. What force is the Lord talking about? He's not talking about intellectual force. He's not talking about physical or military force. He's talking about divine Holy Ghost force. Acts 1.8, you shall receive dudamus. Dudamus in the Greek, that means everlasting power. The very power that flung the universe into existence dwells inside of you as a Christian. And how sad it is that we've allowed that power to become dormant because we have failed to trust in him. We trust in our own selves and we depend upon our own selves and we initiate and activate all of our own ideologies and technologies and methodologies and we forget the power of the Holy Ghost. We've got to have the power of God restored to the churches of God. You can have every program, you can have every camp, you can have every conference, you can have camp meetings, you can have all these things. But if we aren't humble before God in repentance as a Christian and as repentant as a church, we'll never have revival. And without revival, we'll never see the restoration come to this nation that we're all hungry to see. Some of you seated here this morning, you are touched with drugs. Drugs have got your child your children, your spouse, and not just young people, but older folks. Parents of teenagers, drugging and doping. That's a scourge from hell. And we all know it's going on. And it's high time we as God's people did the right thing. And that is to humble ourselves before God and said, oh Lord, we need these seven wells and these seven lambs. That's the title this morning. Old Abraham knowed how to dig a well. And then Beersheba, we've stayed at Beersheba, some of us that went to the Holy Land, at the end of Beersheba. It's a place down there, right square dab between the Mediterranean Sea and the southern edge of the Dead Sea. It's in that fertile crescent, they call it, in the Middle East. You've got barren desert everywhere but in that shape of a crescent moon if you've ever looked at it and right in the heart there's water there and did you know without water you're dying there's three things Abraham always wanted to have he wanted to have a lamb and a well and an altar and let me tell you this morning if you ain't got an altar you don't have God if you don't have the lamb you don't have God And if you don't have fresh water flowing from the artesian artesian reservoir of redemption, then you don't have life. 
probably not eternal in heaven, but definitely not abundant on earth. I hope that you've not, as Jeremiah said, traded this living fountain of water for old broken cisterns. If you're here this morning highly religious, I hope you'll confess that, repent of that, and leave here not being religious but real. I hope you'll shed your denominational dogma and say, I don't want no more of man. I want everything of God. I want me a well. I've got to have an altar. I've got to have the lamb, (laughs) the very lamb of God that brings salvation. And so the opposition to God's work is guaranteed. You will have opposition this week, I promise you. Younger folks, there's a lot of movement today that's trying their best to get your attention away from God. Don't you believe anybody on on face value? Whatever you hear this preacher say, check it out with your own research. Pray over it, think about it, ponder it. I don't expect you to be little robots obediently following a Baptist dogma. I want you to be the living, breathing, mighty people of God filled with the Holy Spirit and you can stand when there's not a preacher nowhere to see. You can be strong when the church folk ain't even there. You're not going to be one laid up there in the ICU waiting area somewhere whining where the preacher and the church folk are. But you'll get on your knees in that ICU unit somewhere with your loved one teetering between life and death and you yourself can grab onto the horns of the altar and know that God's with you and the very power of God's with you and you're not a whiny fied snot nosed baby. You are a fully armored soldier warrior of the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't need anybody but him and you've got the fullness of him in your life. He is the well. He is the lamb. He is the altar where we meet with God. And he said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. So absolutely the opposition to God's work is guaranteed. But look at this. The omnipotence of God's word is greater. (laughs) They've been saying lately, some of the sisters, who's bigger than God? Answer that question. Who is bigger than God? One more time, let me hear you. Who is bigger than God? Who or what is more powerful than God? Is the drug trade more powerful than God? Are all these gangs more powerful than God? Then ask yourself this. If God is in us, then why in the name of God are these drug outfits taking over our region? Come on now. God ain't changed, but God's holy. And his holiness requires a righteous response to the unrighteousness of man. And what grieves the Holy Spirit more? A bunch of sinners wallowing at the hog trough or a bunch of lambs that's supposed to be following him passively going down there on that hog pen trail saying, well, it's okay. We got to get to paddle out of schools. We're going to be offensive if we don't don't just back up on preaching again. Let me tell you something. Sin is still sin. If it was sin in 1960, it's still sin in 2017. And it ain't right for us to be running around here acting like a bunch of hogs. We're the lambs of God supposedly following the shepherd. And you're not gonna be wallowing in an old hog pen if you've been born again. And you're not afraid and you're not ashamed to say what thus saith the Lord. If we'll come to ourself like the prodigal did, we've got us a holy father and he's still got rings and robes and shoes and we can get ourselves back to the father's house and quit hobnobbing around weak kneed and spiny jellyfish backbone saying we can't say nothing about it now. Who told you that? the very devil that's leading everybody, they sung at the crossroads. You turn left, you're going to hell. You gotta go to the cross, turn right, and stay on the straight path. And one of these days, you'll make heaven your home. Now that just blew those Calvinists out to work. You mean I gotta live right? Absolutely. Where's all this business? Doesn't matter if I live right or not. Where'd you get that at? Didn't get it out of the book promise you that well Abraham dug wells 
And he was living in the area of the Philistines. And so are we. We share this planet with people who are lost. Flip over just a few a chapter, couple of chapters to chapter 26 of Genesis. And verse 17, Gerar, the valley of Gerar. Now get this. Look at that. Boy, she, I thank you, Hannah. You right on it, sissy. Dragging away. See that? That's what Gerar means. Abraham was in the world, but he certainly wasn't of it. Young folks, old folks, everybody, yes, we're in this world, but we are not of this world. We got something far better. All through the book of Hebrews, you'll see the word better. We got a better inheritance. We got a better hope. We got a better land. We got a better promise. We got a better place. We got a better priesthood. Thank God for that word better. Paul said it in, in the last verse of, of 1 Corinthians 12. I show you a more excellent way. So this world will drag us away. And they'll try to water things down. And all their propaganda. Some of you blessed World War II vets. Brother Wayne's one of the last ones we got. Is there any other World War II? I said one. Any, I misspoke. Any other World War II veterans here? Did Jim Haggy and Wayne Moore. Are there any others? Give them a good hand clap this morning. I know Brother Wayne was in uh, South Pacific. And Brother Jim back there served in North Africa. Took on Rommel and the boys in North Africa. Went on up to Italy following people like George Patton and some of those generals of World War II. And then Brother Wayne served in the South Pacific, one of the hardest places of fighting anywhere. Of course, Germany was too, up through Italy. And all these fellas, they, they gave their lives, those boys and girls back in the early 40s. So let me tell you, I just want to show you young children that men like these, women like these are fastly dying. We don't have many of our World War II generation left among us. But this old world will drag us away, and they do it a lot by propaganda. I was going to this point, Tokyo Rose. I know Brother Wayne remember her, that radio deal. She'd try to bleed in on armed forces radio, tell all them men that the Jap Japanese were winning, they were gone, Pacific 7th Fleet, they were done for, and all the rest of it. But you had people like old Nimitz and some of the rest of them, they didn't believe that stuff. And young men like Brother Wayne taking those Marines to those little islands and everything else that they could do, and they didn't believe that propaganda. You don't believe what you hear out of ISIS, do you, Brother Kenneth? They'll lie to you. The devil will tell you the church is going down. You'll read headlines now where the, millennial, the millennials are turning away from church. <laughs> don't let them insult your intelligence, young people. There's an amazing thing happened yesterday. I don't know if it fits right in here or not, but I got, have y'all been getting called by Gallup a Survey Organization? They calling all of you. How many got called yesterday by Gallup survey? Well, maybe that was not such a, I thought everybody was getting called. I talked to a young lady somewhere from the Gallup organization. And I told her one thing. I said, write this down and give it to your boss. That us American people out here in the highways and hedges, we're not blind or deaf. I'm getting tired of being insulted, ain't you, as far as our... It, we can see things, we can hear things, and we understand in this war against evil and sin, and then anymore we're crucified verbally if we even use militaristic terms because people don't even have enough sense to know metaphor and symbolic language anymore, and they want to accuse us of being literal all the time. We're not dangerous or harmful physically to anybody. And we're not at war with anybody except Satan and sin and the forces of evil that, that, that continue to devastate lives. So we don't have to listen to all of this propaganda. Flesh it out of your mind. Put the helmet of salvation on that you don't even listen to that stuff. And be very careful with Gerar. They'll drag you away. Now, verse 20. See this Esek here, the well Esek? At strife, the devil will try to pull on you. 
And sadly, sometimes if we fall victim to that and are not victorious over that and we do something that we probably shouldn't be doing, we might feel a little guilty about it, but if we're not careful, being dragged away, the strife will end and the spirit will be grieved because verse 21, the well sitting, hell is hostile towards you. The devil will promise you pleasure, he has only pain. The devil will promise you fun, but he only has misery. The devil will promise you paradise, and he only has torment. He'll do whatever he can to trick you mentally today so that he can chain you and bind you tomorrow. There's a lot in these words. But Abraham knew that place, but he knew there was a resource of water that could keep him with God, that would free him from strife and hostility. Now, verse 22, the well Rehoboth, that's broad places, plenty of room. You look up here this morning, Philippians 4, Paul said to be moderate, don't be dogmatic. We want to go far right, far left, but blessed are the balanced. A common sense balance is what God wants for your life. Abraham was a man of balance. He didn't want to banish Hagar and Ishmael. It grieved his soul. But in his grief, he trusted God. And when Hagar was out in that desert so grieved for her little boy, knew he was dying, and she put him under an old shrub bush out there in the desert, went several feet away with a broken heart and tear-filled eyes and fell on her knees and said, God, and Ishmael, God had mercy on. You can't outrun the mercy of God. You can't escape the love of God. That boy would become a father of another nation. And yet God loved him. God didn't turn his back on nobody. They turned their backs on him. But he was long-suffering. Hear me, church. There is a well. There is a lamb. And get on the altar and get to know the lamb. Abraham told that king of Philistines, take these seven new lambs so you'll know this well, I dug it. (laughs) The devil will fill your wells up. Dig them again. Some of you have been struggling because you're thirsty. And the devil said, there's a well over here and we run over here and that well's not where you need to be. And we'll chase our tail like a dog going round and round. But there's seven wells, seven lambs coming from the lamb and the well. Redig those wells in your life. Don't look to the trinkets of this world. Look to the treasures of God. Verse 23, Beersheba, the well of the oath, where God said, I'll do it. Verse 33, the well Sheba, the place of the oath. Seven is the number of completion. And at the cross, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ settled it all. You remember Exodus I believe it's chapter 17, verse 6, I think, where God said to Moses, smite that rock and the waters will flow. On Golgotha, the rock of ages was smitten by the wrath and the judgment of God. And the living waters flowed from his side to everybody. Church, let's be careful this morning how we criticize people. Because when we criticize people, and in effect what the devil's rejoicing about is that I'm limiting the power of my God. See, when the devil gets my attention off of the grace of God and gets me to looking 
at the meanest of people. And then I forget the mercy of God. I start condemning them. Instead of being who I'm supposed to be. A river of life. That preaches Jesus to them. I can't judge them, only Jesus will. But they need my Jesus. He said in John 3, I didn't come to condemn the world. Why in the world can't we as God's people redig the main well of love and lift up the Lamb and get humble before Him and tarry till we're endued with power from on high? Numbers 20, I believe it's verse 8, isn't it? Where God said, Speak to the rock, Moses. And he smote it two times. They asked John the Baptist, who are you? He said, I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. We can speak the gospel. Inside our hearts, the water of life. Inside our heart, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Romans 1.16, the gospel of Christ is the power of God. The gospel. Are you hearing this this morning? Seven wells, seven lambs. One source of water. One source of life. And if you're saved, you've got the lamb of God within your life. Therefore, you've got the waters of life and the wells of salvation. Are you understanding what God's saying? Don't smite the rock two times. Don't do like Moses and say, well, that crowd over there, they ain't got no hope. (laughs) Oh, unless you do like I do, you're not going to make it. You know, Jesus did it all. He became the full covenant. Genesis 22, what did God say to Abraham? I'll provide myself a lamb for a burnt offering. (laughs) Second Corinthians 5, we were sinful. And yet he who knew no sin became sin that we might be made his righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter 8, he was poor. He was rich and he became poor so that we through his poverty might be made rich. What a message. What a message. We were miserable out there in the depths of sin and now we're ministers, Revelation 1.8. We're kings and priests. What a provision. And who are we? Now that we've been made righteous, we've been made rich, we've been made royalty, who are we to look at everybody else and say, you can't get in? It's not us, it's him. He's already kept all the precepts, statutes, and requirements of the new covenant. He became sin and died and paid the price. He arose again the third day with life, ascended to the right hand of authority on high where he ever lives to make intercession for us. He takes care of it. So, is the water flowing out of your life? (laughs) Is the lamb being elevated and lifted up in your life? All through the Bible, Isaiah 35, the parched ground will become a pool. The thirsty land springs of water. (laughs) Isaiah 41, verse 18, I'll open rivers and high places, fountains in the midst of the valleys. I'll make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. Are you listening? Our people don't have to be drug addicts. Our people don't have to be drunks. Our people don't have to be atheists. This desert land out here needs some rivers flowing through it. These parched places needs a wellspring to come up. And we're in the fertile crescent. We're at the cross. Stay there. At Calvary. That's where our victory is. Our victory is in the rock. There's fire, there's honey, there's water. Everything you'll ever need is right square dab in your heart this morning.
So stop letting the devil get us looking over everywhere else. You know it's interesting down in Psalms 110 verse 7. We'll close with this. He shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. Don't you think little David was thinking about that when he went down there in that valley? And that old big, almost 10 foot tall Philistine giant was down there challenging the people of God that was in battle array on the other side. And old Goliath come up with that plan. Let's don't have a lot of bloodshed. Saul, send me one champion of the Israelites down in the valley to meet me, the Philistine giant. We'll have a one-on-one contest, win or take all. If I kill your man, you all serve us. If your man kills me, we'll all serve you. How's that sound? Well, it sounded pretty good to the Philistines. They all started cheering over there on that ridge. Where's an Israelite that'll dare come down here? (laughs) Well, the three brothers of David sure didn't volunteer. Saul didn't volunteer. Maybe they had parched ground in their heart. Maybe they weren't looking to the Lord, the Lamb of God. Maybe they hadn't put their arms against an altar in a long time. I don't know. But the little fella from the farm, he had been with them, and then he went back home. Jesse sent him up to ten sheep. He asked you a question, how much does it take to get your feelings hurt this morning? How much does it take you to think, well, I'm going to change churches? How much does it take to get you to say, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like the other? Uh, there's not much. It doesn't take much for the average churchgoer to find something they don't like or something that they can criticize or somehow or another say that, well, I need a book. I need a book on that. Now, I'm not minimizing or being flippant. I guess that seems a little obnoxious, doesn't it? I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean to be demeaning anybody's methods of getting yourself encouraged that's fine but I'm telling you the lamb and the altar and the whales on the inside of you at any given moment David didn't say well dad insulted me does he think I'm not able to fight my brothers think they're better than me no God knows you where you are and God has a plan for you not just today but for tomorrow too So Jesse did summons him down and he gave him a little meager errand. He said, take these bags of provision to your brothers who are fighting. Don't underestimate anybody. Don't underestimate anybody. Because the very one you're thinking can't, that's the very one that can. And the very one you think won't is the very one God says will. Some of the times the people out here in this world that we want to criticize and put down are the very ones God will lift up and make mighty warriors for God out of. So you want me to be a little messenger and a little courier? I'll take the stuff, give them to me. And boy, he just swift-footed right on up, met by his brother, and his brother started criticizing him, putting him down and all the rest of it. David just smiled at him. How much does it take to penetrate your armor? Not much. How much does it take to penetrate the armor of the Lord? Nothing can. Martha, you're the only one in here that got that. You went down like that. That's why he said, put ye therefore on the whole armor of God. That shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So when you come around telling me how hurt you are, what you're saying, you don't have the armor of God on. You're not behind the shield of faith. Great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. And God wants to make you that kind of Christian today because that kind of Christian is what's being summoned and called by God right now for the United States of America. We do have completion, those three things we're going to talk about. We do have contentment, and we do have a calling. We are summoned because we're needed. God needs your feet, your hands, your eyes, your mouth, but he wants to solidify your heart with faith so that you won't be weak in yourself, but you'll be strong in him. David got out there and heard Goliath down there cussing, the God of Israel. And he said to Eliab, why are you letting him get by with that? 
So Eliab took out on a tirade against David. Well, you little proud thing, you, you little arrogant thing. That was jealousy in Eliab because the oil had been put on David instead of him. Most time, the people that talk about you, it's coming from jealousy. And how many times have you heard me say if they're kicking you in the hind end, that at least means you're in front of them. You'll never hear a preacher alive or nobody else criticize and mock somebody that they think are littler or weaker than them. They always criticize somebody that they're actually intimidated by. So that means their criticism is actually a compliment? Now you're starting to think with the spiritual mind. David left what his brothers and everybody else said, go in one ear and out the other. And so he boldly said, well, if nobody else will, I will. I'll go down there and fight that fella. Word soon back to the t- Saul. Saul said, let me see my champion. I've got a volunteer. Little David walked in there and his the jaw dropped. He said, you're that little harp player. You can play a harp real good, son, but you're not a warrior. You don't have to defend yourself. If you're in God's will and God's in you and you're engaged in God, it doesn't matter what you say. He didn't take that as an insult either. He didn't verbally respond to Saul. He didn't say a thing. But he knew in his heart, yeah, I can play a harp pretty good, but I can throw a rock pretty good too. I'm multi, I'm, I've got multiple capabilities here because I've been hanging out with God. I done found me an altar up on the mountain. I know the lamb. I know the shepherd too. And the shepherd became the lamb, offered himself without spot to God. Then he arose. The testator became the administrator. Are you hearing this? It's all in him and it's all at the cross. And if you're looking anywhere else, you're finding defeat. But if you're looking at the feet of Jesus, you've got victory yesterday, today, and forever. Somebody ought to shout, I know that to be true in my life. And I'm not gonna be overcome of evil. I'm gonna overcome evil with good. Saul said to him, well, I'll help you, David. And he put that old big helmet on him, put all this other stuff on him. For now on to, what, almost seven foot tall man putting all that hard armor on a little old boy. David, polite. You see, you can be nice. You can have long suffering. You can be gentle and kind. You don't have to be a smart aleck. If you're gonna be a voice, if you're gonna be somebody that can show the water and let the water flow through you into this parched land, you don't need to be a critic. You don't need to be hateful. You don't have to be a smart aleck. He didn't talk back to Saul. He just said, I can imagine, sir, if you don't mind, could I please take this stuff off? Because I haven't proven them. Saul said, boy, do what you're gonna do. Because he's probably thinking in his mind, you're gonna be, dog. You're gonna be fed to the birds after a while anyway. That guy's going to drop kick you and chop you in pieces in a matter of seconds. So it doesn't matter if you got arm or not. Just go on. We're all going to serve the Philistines. We're all cooked. We're all going down. Hear that? CNN. We've got a Gallup Pew, Pew Research. Says that the millenniums don't like God anymore. Oh, we've got all these uh, polls and all this stuff. Christianity's dying in America. Are you believing all that stuff? The Philistines were believing all that. They're just chomping at the bits and salivating. Boy, just as quick as Goliath wins this victory, we're gonna be overlords of all of Israel for another 30 or 40 years. They're just chomping at the bits, a cheering and a high-fiving and a clapping and all the rest of it. And finally, there's a little movement up there across the other ridge. And somebody left their encampment, started down the ridge, and they got to looking, they got to looking. Finally, one of them spied out, come back and said, that's just a boy. That's just a little boy, and he looks like a shepherd. He's got a little shepherd clothes on, and he's carrying a little staff in his hand, and he's got a little slingshot hung on his side. That's just a little shepherd boy. Boy, they really go wild in. They said, we know they're all scared to death. They've all conceded defeat. They've all conceded to us. They're just sacrificing that little old boy. Maybe they're trying to appease their God, or they didn't understand. Bottom line, they didn't understand a thing. And neither the same crowd today. That verse we read in Psalms a minute ago. What's a brook? It's running water. What's the rock? That's Jesus. What's five? That's his grace. And in this running water in this brook right here, you can find the grace of Jesus. You better watch out, Goliath. Hey, somebody now got the helmet of salvation on. You can't see it, but God put it on him. 
He's got a breastplate of righteousness. That, that big old weaver's uh, beam, that big old spear ain't going to penetrate. I don't care how heavy that stone is you made that spearhead. It's not going to get through that breastplate. And that little boy's balanced with that loin girdle of truth. And he's dangerous to you because he's got my shield in one hand and he's got my sword in the other. And there ain't nobody going to stand against the sword of the Lord and the shield of faith and feed shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He bowed down in that running water and reached down to the resource of God Almighty, life itself. Old Goliath was over our cussing out of darkness and death. Little old David was praising God out of life and light. And he got up and old Goliath said, you're going to be bird food. You, the wild fowls going to eat you today. You come to me, little boy, you're going to die today. And that little feller said, now wait a minute. In his heart, the same God that spared me from a bear and the same God that directed my rock into the skull of a lion. You don't bring the fear out of me like they did. First time that bear come by scared me to death, but God blessed me. Then God shoot a line. Kenneth, the drill sergeant, that old D.I. Holy Ghost was getting that little feller ready. And every test that little feller passed. And Saul thought he wasn't ready. The whole land of Israel didn't think he was ready. But God was smiling in heaven saying, my young man is more than ready. And he started out in a run toward that giant and let the rock go and God directed the rock right through the opening in that Philistine helmet and right into the head of that giant. Whatsoever that giant is in your life, if it's addiction, throw the rock. Where you get the rock? In the running water and let the running water Water, flow all of that stuff out of you and let the power of God from an altar get God's power and anointing in your life and you don't have to be overcome. You can be an overcomer. You young preachers in here get filled up and fired up with the power of the Holy Ghost and you don't have to be like them to win them. Stand against sin. You don't have to put on shows. Show them the Savior. The giant went down. David lifted his head up. That meant the position of the Philistines had changed. They all ran in fright. Going over a few chapters when David was running from Saul and he went to the house of God, if you want to say that, priest of Bimelech, David said, you got any bread and armament here? Nothing but holy bread. And so God allowed David to eat the holy bread. David said, you got any weapons? God will take that which is aiming to destroy you and give it in your... Heavenly Father, impress upon us the reality of your word that the river is flowing, that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we can be and are more than conquerors through you. That it's, a, it's true, not just a little slick cliche. It's your word. We can do all things through you. So help folks not to be discouraged in today's political climate or moral climate, but help us to know as your people through you, we have victory and our purpose and our calling remains the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. So we appreciate we appreciate that, Lord. And I pray you'll seal and solidify and burn that fact into our hearts and minds as your people that we will truly be, in all actuality, rivers in the desert and pools of water in parched land. That we can be that reservoir of those rivers that flow with the story of redemption. And that we are people of love, not people of hate. People that try to build others up, not tear people down. People of conversion, not condemnation. So minister to your ministers and to your church folks in all of our local churches. What a powerful thing it would be if we could see some unity among ourselves, unctionized by you with an urgency, Lord, to get the message of your love and your gospel out into the highways and hedges of this world. 
So help us not to listen to the news media or some self-appointed authoritative little star or uh, you know, artist or celebrity. <laughs> My God, help us as your people to listen to you and to know that our calling is as pertinent today as it's ever been or ever will be. And we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. So encourage your people to be actively engaged in your work according to your will. And you're always here for us, Lord, for the sick, the struggling, the suffering, the stressed, whatever ordeal or upheaval they may be facing in their lives, you're right there with them as their strength and their guidance and their grace and their peace. Thank you, God. Now, more importantly than anything else, those who may be lost, I pray in the name of Jesus that conviction will fall upon them and that they'll be saved. For those who left your house today without making that definite commitment to you, I pray they'll do it soon and real soon. So as you minister to us, may we be attentive, responsive, obedient to your directives and thereby recipients and possessors and purveyors of the glorious story of your deliverance. Thank you, God. Encourage your people. Reach out with love to those who may yet be unsaved. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Always been a real joy to pray with you every week, to bring the gospel to you every week. It's not a burden. It's not a chore. It is indeed a blessing for us to be able to bring the focus of freedom to you. Now, as we leave you, Please pray for us this week at the Camp Zion Church in Galax. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we're there, 7 p.m. each evening. And just hold us up in prayer. And then really, really make it a matter of prayer concerning e-camp this summer. And to all of the pastors and youth pastors and youth workers in your particular local church, I got a little offer for you here as I leave you tonight. If you would like to be involved in a true regional home mission outreach, we need all the volunteers we can get. And if you think it's easy getting volunteers to handle this massive <laughs> effort of tending to these children every day through the summer, <laughs> then, you know, it's, it's quite challenging in this day's world. So last year we were blessed with particularly one church group who came and spent several days with us. They stayed in the dormitories. They labored in the classes. Some taught, some assisted, some did different things uh, in the dining room, different things. So if your church group uh, would like to be involved in helping us here at E-Camp at Camp Freedom this summer, please just get a hold of us. And the way contact information is there on your screen and especially just by clicking on ftministries.org, that'll direct you to where you need to be and who you need to contact. That would be a wonderful, wonderful service uh, ministry uh, for you and your church or your group or if you're an individual and you'd like to volunteer some time this summer, we would appreciate it. We really truly would and you would be able to serve the Lord and be a blessing and a resource of wisdom and guidance to these children this summer here at Camp Freedom. Thank you so very much for considering that. Now, it's been a joy to be with you tonight as always. Thanks for watching. Until next week, may God bless you richly. Then may He use you for His glory and to be a real blessing to someone else.